peace be upon you. So I love watching these nature documentaries because I see these parallels between the animal community and lessons that I can learn for day-to-day -day life. In one of these clips, it really stuck with me. It left this impression and it was kind of disturbing. It was a clip of a lion and it was sneaking up on this pack of kudo. And kudo are kind of like gazelle, but they have these giant antlers. They're pretty powerful uh, creatures. And what it did is it slowly would creep up and then it would pounce and attack and take down one of the kudo. Now that's not really surprising. What I found absolutely surprising is how all the other kudo in vicinity, none of them did anything. None of them even ran away. Once they realized that the lion was no longer a threat to them, they continued on their day as if nothing was happening. They're eating right, you know, the, the grass right next to this lion who's devouring one of their own. And they just looked at this as normal behavior. And it made me think, what happens in a society when we start behaving like these kudo? That when we see a lion take down an innocent individual, that we just say, ah, as long as it's not me, that's okay. And um, it made me think of the story of Moses. And what a noble trait this individual had. That when he was in a status of power, prestige, he had everything on the line. And he heard one of the fellow children of Israel plea for his help. That he was willing to risk all that to help out this individual. And unfortunately, through that series of events, when he goes and defends the children of Israel, the individual who's part of the children of Israel, uh, he punched and killed the Egyptian. And this caused him to lose everything. But despite that, the next day, the same individual pleads for his help again. And he almost did the same thing again, meaning that it didn't matter to him that he was always going to stand up on the side of justice, that he was always going to defend those who didn't have a voice, who didn't have the status in society, because God gave him these abilities, these gifts. And this is how he chose to use them, to benefit and help other people. You see that when Moses was out in the desert and he had nothing, he had no food, no water, no shelter, that when he saw a group of people watering and noticed there was just two women standing on the side, that rather than going and begging for food or asking for money or asking for a wage, what he did is he went to them and said, what is it that you guys need? And when they explained to them the situation that, yeah, they have a, a father who's elderly and uh, they can't get water until the, uh, the crowd disperses, he went and used his God-given gifts to go and provide water for these individuals. And this was the kind of individual Moses was. He was always thinking about the betterment of others. But now when we look at society, you see certain traits that are no longer about how do we help one another. But it's more of the realm of the kudo, who as long as we're not the one who's being victimized, we're not the one who's being attacked, we're not the one who's being devoured, we're okay watching other bystanders go through this process and we do and say nothing. The other day, there was an incident in New York City where a full-grown man goes, front kicks an elderly Asian woman and proceeds to stomp on her, breaking her hip if I'm not mistaken. And that's a horrendous uh, uh, incident, no doubt, no question about it. But the sad part was there was a group of security guards at the apartment who were watching this entire thing uh, play out, and they did nothing. They simply watched, observed, and one of them actually went and closed the door, creating a barrier between them and the, uh, the, and the victim and the perpetrator. And... Thank God there's outrage in society about such events because what causes a society to fall is not conflict. It's not fighting. It's apathy. Once a society becomes apathetic to the well-being of others and seeing others being brutally attacked or victimized in front of their eyes and they do nothing, that that is when a society has nothing to hold on to, that they're willing to let it all burn down, all crumble, because as long as they're safe, as long as they don't feel threatened, they're okay as long as there's others who are being victimized. And this is the problem when society becomes too fixated on the self, when they only think about what's good for themselves, that we miss the bigger picture. Because what keeps a society just and virtuous and prosperous is when we advocate righteousness 
and prohibit evil, that when a society becomes apathetic to the evils that transpire and we don't become encouraging to things that are righteous and good, to the betterment of other individuals, then it's just a matter of time before that society falls apart. When people stop caring for one another and stop caring about the injustices that are occurring in society, then the society starts tearing at the seams. And it's fascinating because you realize in these societies, what causes this to happen? And I can think of a couple culprits. One big aspect is when we outsource uh, our righteous deeds to others. And you see this happen a lot in countries that are a lot more authoritarian. Uh, you take communist China. You know, the amount of charity that people give in communist China is a pittance compared to societies like the United States. The amount of charitable giving that is done in the United States, it dwarfs all the other countries. And the reason is, I believe, is because we still have a society where the individual right is cherished where we don't fully have gone down that deep end of outsourcing our righteousness to others. And an example of this is there was an individual, he was an American, uh, he happened to be black, he was in China, and he sees an elderly person and he goes and he buys them McDonald's and he gives it to them. And this became widespread media phenomenon in China where they called this individual a uh, French fry brother. And because for them, it was so strange for someone to go and use their own money to go and buy food for someone else that they don't understand why you would do that. Because in that society, the expectation is that this is the government's job. It's the government's job to take care of others. It's the government's job to take care of the poor. And yes, the government has a element of this responsibility, but the bulk of this responsibility needs to be on the people. People need to feel emboldened to take on ownership, to help one another. Once we allow and we outsource all this to the state, to the government, then all of a sudden people feel like they're not on the hook. This is someone else's job. What do I need to intervene for? What about the, the trouble and the hassle this is going to cause me? And once we have that mentality where we think that in essence, it's no longer my responsibility to help my neighbor. It's no longer my responsibility to feed the poor. It's no longer my responsibility to stand up for the oppressed. Then all of a sudden, you have a society that's become purely apathetic. They outsourced all their good works, their righteousness to the government. And they assume that since, hey, they're paying their taxes, they're doing their part, that it's the government's responsibility if people are suffering. It's the government's responsibility if people uh, are homeless, unsheltered, uh, they don't have food. And once we do that, we're missing out on a crucial part. You know, God is constantly telling us to give. And you think about what does that mean to give? You give your time, you give your money, you become the provider for these individuals to make their lives better. Once we distance ourselves from the individuals we're trying to help, where we're saying, look, I'm just going to give my taxes to the government and the government takes over it, then all of a sudden we become desensitized to the pain and suffering of others. But once you become intimate with it, once you learn these individuals, you meet them, you become friendly with them, it has a lot more emotional punch and you realize the pain and suffering of others. But as we distance ourselves from the pain and suffering of others and we outsource this responsibility of taking care of it to a government institution, then when we firsthand see someone who's homeless, who's despondent, who's hungry, we say, hey, it's not on me. Someone else, this is someone else's responsibility. And, you know, again, thank God that there is an outrage regarding uh, this incident because the real concern would be if something like this happened and no one said anything. If you never heard about it in the news, in the media. And there's another culprit that seems almost unrelated. But interesting enough, there was this video from Little Nas where without getting into the details, you know, he's uh, doing uh, sexual explicit acts to Satan. And uh, it's, you know, glamorizing uh, satanic culture. Um, we, we can just leave it at that. And what's interesting about that is that if you look in the concept of Satanism, uh, for instance, they asked a quote from the Church of Satan regarding the Little Nas's video. And uh, David Harris, who's the magister for the Church of Satan, so kind of like their cardinal, he said, basically, we worship ourselves. We refer to ourselves as I-theists. 
we see ourselves as our own God. When you see yourself as your own God, when you worship yourself, in essence, the pain and suffering of others means nothing to you. Because what's the point of getting involved? What's the point of possibly facing those ramifications similar to what Moses faced? If all of a sudden I intervene, then uh, you know I get charged for whatnot. Um, that thought, that mentality, that all I care about is the self. All I think about is the self. And I, uh, I measure everything to how it reflects upon myself as an individual. And I could care less about the pain and suffering of others then in essence, you have a society that again is less interested when the lion comes and attacks one of our own. In Surah 12 verse 53, we read in the Quran about the response from the governor's wife when she was questioned about her uh, claims against Joseph. And what she says, she says, I do not claim innocence for myself. The self is an advocate of vice, except for those who have attained mercy for my Lord. My Lord is forgiver, most merciful. Here we have an example. When you're only interested in your own self, you could care less how many years in prison Joseph was sent to because that has no interest to you. That has no bearing to you. It's only when you care about the pain and suffering of others can you actually go and make a conscious effort to help them out to better their situation. But what's fascinating is most people, they don't want to be involved in the fight. They don't want to basically intervene. They much prefer to just be a watching observer. And as long as the threat isn't directed towards them, they're totally fine grazing and going about their day as if nothing's happening. And we see in Surah 8 verse 48 that this is actually what the devil does. This is the devil had adorned their works in their eyes and said, you cannot be defeated by any people today and I will be fighting along with you. But as soon as the two armies faced each other, he turned back on his heels saying, I disown you. I see what you do not see. I'm afraid of God. God's retribution is awesome. The devil is a coward. And individuals who are taking up the cause of the devil are going to also act cowardly. That when they see injustice happening, they're going to turn a blind eye. They're going to look the other way. They're going to act as if they don't notice. But a true believer is someone who speaks up for the, the, the oppressed, for those who are being aggressed upon. And they do what they can in their limited capacity to try to set things right. In Surah 2 verse 216, it reads, Fighting may be imposed on you even though you dislike it, but you may dislike something which is good for you, and you may like something which is bad for you. God knows while you do not know. Most people don't want to be in a realm of confrontation. And it makes sense. It kind of goes against most people's natural instinct to want to keep civility, don't want to rock the boat. But there's times and places where we need to speak out. If you have the physical means, maybe it's physical. If you don't, you have the voice, you have the, the uh, platform. You do what you can to try to set things right. And this is one of the definitions of righteous, saleh. Which means to this is the trait of the believer is they try to set things right. They try to reconcile. They try to maintain the peace. They fight the aggressors. They speak against oppression and aggression. And they never, never become apathetic to the situation and the deterioration of society. God willing, we're going to end there. If you guys got comments or questions, please hit us up at QuranTalk at gmail.com. Uh, if you guys want to follow along the verses of the Quran, we have the Quran Study app on the iOS App Store. Uh, I've been out of commission the last couple weeks working on a big update for that and also some interesting research on the Quran that God willing, I'll share in a future episode. And uh, if you like the podcast, please share it with others. Leave us a review. And until next time, peace and God bless.